Forum, now, glad to have you all here. Host, we kept the volume a bit Masco. low, but your volume has been extra high. And I'm not sure whether it's because we've got a sight of wine or not. Seems like it. So, we may rethink that for November, but thank you everyone for being here. Uh, it's, a great, uh, it's a great crowd. Thank you so much for, for being here. Uh, we've got an awesome lineup uh, tonight here at the, uh, the Functional Forum for Microbiome Maximized Medicine. Uh, this is a topic that's been uh, close to heart. If you've been watching the Functional Forum uh, every month, you know this is something that we come back to, mainly because it's such uh, an important topic in medicine at really changing the paradigm of healthcare, which is what we're about. Um, so we have some amazing guests here today. Uh, this, for those people who have not watched the forum before, and for those tens of thousands of people who are watching streaming, we've got we've got. Uh, it's not a TV show. Um, you can share it on Facebook. It's on on uh, it's on uh, YouTube right now. You can tweet questions. Uh, later on, we're going to have a panel, and so we're going to have. You can live tweet your questions in, and we'll be following it. Just use hashtag functional forum, and um, yeah, we'll keep it going all uh, all night. So, it's been about four months since we had an event here. Uh, the last one was in June, and we've been pretty um, pretty busy, if I don't say so myself. Um, we had two months in the summer where we had our first uh, IFM collaboration, and um, the Institute for Functional Medicine has been a leader in, in functional medicine, obviously, you know, being at the genesis of it. Uh, but the two events that we did with them were pre-recorded uh, from their conference. It was the first time that we got Dr. Jeff Bland, onto the forum, which was a, which was a, a great moment to, uh, to have his talk. And then the forum in, Octo in, uh, in August, we really focused and we had a, 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 the, the main speaker that we had there was Dr., uh, Dr. George Slavich. And he was talking about a new area of medicine called social genomics. And this is essentially looking at how your gene expression is affected by your community and your relationships. And that's one of the things that we're really excited about. This is the genesis of the Functional Forum, was starting a meetup group for providers in New York. And so just by being here you, and meeting all the people around, you are actually um, not only creating health through those relationships, but also sharing all of your healthy microbiomes and, uh, and keeping each other well. But you know, the other side effect of the IFM event, which was really amazing and having the IFM collaboration is now we have uh, literally hundreds of meetup groups across the, the world and some amazing things that happened. So this is eight o'clock right now. We're live uh, in New York at 8 p.m. EST. So some of the meetup groups on the West Coast have their event live. Some of them do it a bit later. But unexpectedly, it's eight in the morning in the Philippines. And the Philippines love the functional forum, apparently. And we saw this amazing photo after the July one of a group of doctors sitting, watching the functional forum in the Philippines live. And it was super awesome. I was really, um, really excited for it. So thanks so much, everyone, for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers, some speakers that I wanted to have on the functional forum for a long time, others that I've seen speak at conferences. And I know that they really communicate the, you know, this, this paradigm shifting information in a great way. So next month, we have another IFM collaboration. It's called the Hormone Symphony. It'll be back here on November 2nd. Uh, so um, make sure that you're here for that. So the other thing that we'll be doing this summer is we did the Evolution of Medicine Summit Part 2. And, um, you know, the, the, how the evolution of medicine got going was the, the, um, the tagline for the Functional Forum was accelerating the evolution of medicine. We saw that medicine needed to evolve because it was designed for acute disease and we have an epidemic of chronic disease and it had to evolve and adapt to its environment. But what we saw essentially is that, you know, after a year of doing this, is that... Um, What's needed for acute disease and what's needed for a chronic disease are actually, in, in, in a lot of ways, fundamentally opposite. And one just doesn't evolve into another very quickly. And that's why I think we're seeing that such a slow evolution of medicine. And so we talked about healthcare from scratch. And not just talking about healthcare from scratch, but building healthcare from scratch. And when I left you here in June at our last live event in New York uh, that was you know, streamed live, uh, we have done one since then, and it's going to be uh, a part of the Dr. Jerry show. Dr. Jerry's in the house, a new PBS show. Look out for that next, uh, next, uh, next spring. Um, but yeah, we, we looked at healthcare from scratch, and we decided not to do sponsors. We decided to bring to the world through the summit, and we had 65,000 people signed up. We brought um, something that has been the missing piece for medicine, which has been, guess what? health insurance, affordable health insurance. So we launched Liberty Direct, harnessing the power of community to create health and save money on healthcare. So I'm in, I'll show you, I've got my card right here. 
that's my other card. But I have got my card in here. But uh, yeah, I've got my uh, Liberty Direct card. And look, if, you have a, if you're in Liberty Direct and you get hit by a bus tomorrow, I'm happy to pay a little bit of your fees. And for the other 35,000 people in the group, they're happy to pay for my fees too. And this is health conscious individuals sharing healthcare costs. It's ACA compliant. You opt out. You don't have to be part of the Obamacare mandate. And um, it's been a great success. We've had lots of people signing up, lots of interest. And just, you know, if you haven't signed up yet, which I'm sure some of you haven't who are watching here, it's all right. We're playing the long game because when I started looking for health insurance for me and my family in New York, this was the simple plan. So, and the bronze, which basically has a ridiculous deductible, I'm not even going to tell you how big it is, but because you'd probably um, you'd laugh slash cry, uh, but that's 973 right up to 1631. This is just basic for me, my wife, and my two year old, right? So, the, the fact that my, the, the, you know, Liberty Direct for the same people is 449 a month and I can start to pay for integrative therapies, surely that's a no-brainer. And if it's not no-brainer enough, we'll wait to see you in January when healthcare premiums go up 30%. Because if you add 30% to any one of these, you see that it's not that nice looking. So, um, yeah, so we're building it and the Functional Forum, you know, still accelerating the evolution of medicine. Our goal is to use these events to be able to bring to you speakers that will help to move, the, move forward and anyone who's watching to be able to access this information. We wanted to bring down the barriers to entry to doctors to find out about this information so it's not at a thousand dollar seminar once a year with only a thousand dollar, you know, a thousand doctor capacity. We need tens of thousands of doctors and practitioners, hundreds of thousands to learn about microbiome maximized medicine now and so this is why we created the functional forum and we're so glad that all of you guys are here so just a quick shout out past guest on the forum last year was uh, dr. Drew Ramsey it's National Kale Day in two days so I'm also guessing you know National Kale Day like he's the guy who got Beyonce to wear the kale t-shirt right so you know that is a serious movement for nutrient density into the mainstream but it's probably a bit late to organize your own event, although there is an awesome event happening in New York. Check it out. But anyone here, just prescribe some kale on, on Wednesday. Take a chance. Prescribe some kale. Uh, you can host an event. Go to nationalkaleday.org slash kalerx and um, check out all the different options there. I just wanted to give a shout out because Drew is a good friend. And look, Drew is an initiative taker who has taken the conversation forward, and we need a lot more of that. And so um, I'm glad to have him here. And we're also doing this thing later this month because we're not doing enough awesome stuff all the time. Um, and it's called uh, the Evolution of Medicine Film Festival. So basically, we already have a couple dozen uh, practitioners around the country that have uh, scheduled uh, screenings of Escape Fire. And if you go to goevomed.com slash film, you'll see this. And you'll see essentially you can go, you can do it at a theater, you can do it at a community venue. Some people are doing it outside of the time frame that we prescribed, which was the 26th to 29th. I don't care. Keep do it whenever you want. The whole goal of it is to engage your community into this conversation. I will tell you that Escape Fire converts people to be excited about integrative medicine like no other film asset on the planet. It is unbelievably good at converting people to want to see a functional doctor, an integrative provider, and guess who they're going to go and see at the end of the movie? The doctor who's doing the Q&A at the end of it. So go to goevomed.com slash film, sign up. It's free to do it. All you have to do is sell a certain number of tickets. Tug does all the work to negotiate with the movie place and with the, um, you know, and with the theater and with the movie, uh, the people, the directors of the movie or whoever you pay once the movie's done. Um, and it's super easy. You do it in like three clicks. It takes five minutes. So goevomed.com slash film and check out Escape Fire. And um, the same week, uh, I wanted to just give a quick plug. I'm speaking with Dr. Mimi Guarneri at the AIHM conference. Um, some of my favorite doctors on the planet who are certified by these guys, are the, you know, board certified in integrated holistic medicine. I'm very excited to go and meet the tribe of doctors there, but they've got an epic lineup. Um, go and check it out and hopefully uh, see you in San Diego. Uh, we also have Heal Thy Practice is coming up in 10 days in, uh, as well. Eric's in the house from, uh, from Holistic Primary Care. So look, if you, if, you, if you can't do any conferences during the Jewish holidays and you can't do any conferences after Thanksgiving, there's basically a four week window where you can do all of the conferences. <laughs> so if you're concerned that all the conferences seem to be coming at the same weekend, that's why. Because I've tried putting on conferences too and it's almost impossible. Um, so <laughs> essentially this is, you know, this is what we have coming up here. So 
If you haven't watched the functional forum before, you know, what we're really focused on is creating this network of integrated micro practices. That's our vision to transform medicine. We want to empower doctors and providers to build their own successful integrated micro practices and actually own a part of this revolution or evolution. It's going to happen. It's happening right now. We're trying to accelerate it. But whether or not you end up as a business owner and being a leader in your local community, or you end up being a employee of the system when they end up coming around to it, the choice is yours, and you can choose that right now. And we're going to bring you resources tonight to help you with all parts of this, um, starting with the central theme. Now, people were wondering which way our content was going to go in the third season. This is the third season of the Functional Forum. Started last month when we uh, introduced the health insurance or the quasi alternative to health insurance because it's not technically insurance. Um, but you know, we're going to talk about microbiome maximized medicine, and we're actually going to talk a little bit about auras. Weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> Auras. You know, most people thought we'd only get to energy medicine in, uh, in series, uh, series seven. Um, but I saw this in Newsweek, and I thought it was awesome. Your microbiome extends like a microbial crowd around you, like an aura. So maybe those people who thought they could see your aura or tell you how big it was or you're bumping into it, you're actually just bumping into their microbial cloud. Seems a little bit more plausible and potentially a little bit more easy accessible because this is a fact, right? This is happening. This is an actual fact. People are walking around with microbes all the time. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean they aren't there. And today we're going to talk about redesigning medicine for a situation that honors the fact that we do have a microbial cloud. Because we better do things a little bit differently because I, there's some amazing TED Talks out there recently. I saw them the other day. You know, um, antibiotic resistance is possibly the biggest problem facing mankind, right? We live in this 85-year-old, 85-year, 100-year window when anti antimicrobials or anti um, antibiotics worked. You know, for our three generations of uh, of, uh, of our family ago, they didn't have it. And in two generations or one generation, they may not have it again. So it's really important we get this right. So we're going to introduce our first speaker. I've wanted to have her on the Functional Forum for a long time. Um, it's really cool to have an integrative pediatric neurologist. Um, this is a doctor who is on the cutting edge of mending brains of kids that have brains that need mending. And there are more and more of them. And so uh, she has a new book coming out next year called The Dirt Cure. So for her uh, last year on the Brain Forum, it was actually in October last year, The Evolution of Brain Health, uh, we had Dr. Street Klein on. And she said something that I still remember to this day. She says, the gut is the soil where the brain grows. And it really stuck with me throughout the year. I'm super excited to have her making her debut on the Functional Forum, Dr. Mom, uh, Maya Shutri Klein. OK, great. Um, can you hear me? So it's wonderful to be here. Um, I am going to be going through a lot of slides but um, because I have a lot I want to share with you. But um, if I go too fast, you can just see a lot more of this when my book comes out in January, because I actually talk about it a lot more there. Um, so let's begin. Um, <clears throat> so this is a quote I really like. And I think it's important to internalize it. And hopefully, it will become very clear. Um, why I'm bringing this up in a few seconds. But, um, you know, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Um, and I want just for a minute for everyone to close their eyes and imagine what a healthy child looks like. So just take a second to do that. Okay, so open your eyes and tell me. Just call out a couple things that you saw. What did you, how did you identify that was a healthy child? Straight posture, Straight posture smiling, smiling. Yeah. happy. Okay, joy, jumping, bright eyes. Okay, so I bring that up because um, I think that we see so many sick people and sick kids that we don't actually always know what health looks like, you know? And, um, and I just have asked a lot of people, what is health? What does health look like to you? And um, the answers are like pretty surprising uh, because I don't think a lot of people do know what it looks like. And um, so health is not 
only the absence of disease. And it's not just about whether we're showing symptoms. Actually, I don't think either. And it's not simply about lab results. Like I've been to pediatricians, you know, giving this talk, this kind of talk, and they say, good BMI or growing on the curve or, you know, good CBC or, you know, like that is not, I mean, those are reflective sometimes of health, but there's something more going on, right? So, oh, I have to point it in the right place, okay. So health is the relationship between the internal and the external terrain, okay? And I think that health manifests as resilience, okay? So I actually think um, that resilience is the ability to bounce back. So stressors are inevitable. Like kids are not always gonna be smiling. And I don't even think they're supposed to always be smiling, okay? Um, stressors are actually necessary to build resilience. And we know that chronic diseases are rising in children. I don't actually need to go into the details um, and the diseases, okay? But I think chronic disease is actually a reflection of lack of resilience. So there's actually some science behind this. It's not just something I'm making up. Um, Bob Navio's great work um, on the cell danger response. And the cell danger response basically says that there is this evolution, there is this evolutionarily designed metabolic response that protects cells and hosts from harm when there's a stressor. And what happens is that there are these encounters um, that are threats and they stress our homeostasis, our ability to maintain homeostasis. And then after the danger has been eliminated um, or neutralized, then there's all these anti-inflammatory processes that happen and kind of get things back the way they should be and reverse that process. Um, but sometimes it persists abnormally and then it affects gut microbiome and metabolism and it disrupts all the body organ systems. So, um, this is, uh, these are slides from Russ Blaylock, who has done some really amazing work in this area um, in the brain. And so this is an example, basically, in microglia of the cell danger response. And microglia are kind of immune cells in the brain, but actually more than that. They're kind of nurse cells. And they are in a three to one ratio with neurons. So they're really busy doing things to nourish and take care of neurons. But when they get activated, by whatever stressor may come along. There's these cytokines and chemokines that are released and it causes this whole excitotoxin um, cascade, okay? And the cascade should, like basically produces um, free radicals, mitochondrial dysfunction, and immunoexcitotoxicity. So this is basically what the cell danger response looks like in the brain. Um, and we know that the, that microglial activation is connected very um, deeply to every neurodegenerative disorder that's in existence at this point and, in, and autism and Tourette's and ADD and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and on and on and on. And so then the microglia can switch back to reparative mode and they release BDNF, brain-derived neuro neurotrophic factor and nice growth factors and anti-inflammatory cytokines and everything is nice and happy and the neurons repair. Okay, so let's talk for a second about terrain. What does terrain look like in children now? So we have a lot of things that are, are challenging and different from how they were. You know, we've got different flora in the parents. We have, um, we have C more C-sections rather than vaginal birth, formula feeding versus breastfeeding. And I mean, each of these topics we could talk, there could be a whole talk about it, right? Um, chronic use of antibiotics, steroids, all these vaccines, lots of pharmaceuticals, processed food, and a lot of time indoors. And so our current health paradigm is that, okay? We're afraid of everything. We're afraid of... We're afraid of antibiotics. We're af I mean, we're afraid of germs. We're afraid of um, sun. We're afraid of dirt. We're afraid of, um, like someone once, I put a slide of nature up and someone after the talk said how upset they were that I put this slide about nature because they got Lyme disease when they were out in nature. So they don't think you're supposed to be in nature and it was like really upsetting to them. Okay. One day, okay. So where did we get this idea of avoid, avoid, avoid? So our, our good friend, Louis Pasteur, um, back in the day, 
uh, basically said, okay, well, diseases are, are caused by these microscopic, invisible to us microorganisms, um, and, and they invade us, and they basically um, grow out of control and reproduce and kill us. Right? I mean, that's the germ theory. Okay? And it's not like totally off. I mean, we do know that that is an element of what happens. It's sort of that story of the elephant, right? Like the blind man and the elephant, and we're all touching, right? So there is that process that does happen sometimes. But there was another school of thought at the same time, um, Claude Bernard and others, who had this other idea of the cellular theory. And um, oh, we skipped there. OK. So most microbial diseases are caused by organisms present in the body of a normal individual. And they become the cause of disease when a disturbance arises which upsets the equilibrium of the body. OK. So I think of the germ theory as kind of a sitting duck theory, right? Like we're just sitting there, and basically anything could come your way and attack you and kill you. And there's nothing you could do about it. The cellular theory I think of as the terrain theory. OK. And the terrain theory is who is the person who is the host of the organism and what's happening in that relationship. Um, and the cellular theory kind of gives you an idea that maybe you actually could do something about what's happening in the body. Oh, I'm like not getting this so right. OK. So our bodies actually crave complexity. And our immune systems are actually like not like these warriors that we thought, but kind of more meet and greet. Meet and greet, you know, likes to meet lots of different organisms all the time, and, and learning and kind of uh, developing that way. So I actually think this magic bullet model, um, like antibiotics, right, or vaccines, or any of these things are really outdated because really biodiversity is what we're learning is the new magic bullet, if there were one. So our paradigm is starting to change. We, we're using probiotics. We're using things like Saccharomyces boulardii, yeast. Yeast is helping, you know, to get rid of things like C. diff, the microvirome and oncolytic viruses, which I'm going to talk about, and things like soil-based organisms and fecal transplants. Can you imagine 15, 20 years ago talking about infusing feces into people? I mean, you know. But here it is, and it has good data. So. Um, we know that diverse microbes actually prevent atopic disease. And, you know, so there's a study that we all know about the hygiene hypothesis, right? And there's this study that basically said kids on farms are less likely to have atopy, asthma, and so on. So um, we thought, okay, well, that's probably because in urban areas there's just not so much microbes, right? So then that's probably what it is. But someone actually said, well, let's actually examine that. So they did. And it turned out, no, there were the same number of microbes, more or less. Um, the difference was the diversity. So on a farm, there were many, 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 many more organisms, whereas urban, many fewer, a very narrow array. And that actually is what they felt made the difference. So now we're also starting to understand how, you know, atopic disease and asthma and all these kind of uh, allergic and autoimmune responses are really coming, being driven by the gut and being driven by flora. And although we're talking about the gut microbiome, I want to just kind of remind everybody that we have a lot of microbiomes in our body. Um, I think the skin microbiome is something we ignore a lot, and I think, you know, that's probably related to vitamin D issues, how we absorb vitamin D, and there's, I mean, I think there's a lot that could be said about our total microbiome. Even the placenta has a microbiome, um, which we used to think was sterile. So there's a lot of microbiomes to think about, but we are all into the gut right now, so that's where we'll go. Um, and, you know, we're learning, basically, again, that, like, babies with certain kinds of flora and more narrow flora are more likely to develop asthma later. And we're learning about viruses having a role as well. Look at that, because we thought viruses were terrible things which we need to um, avoid at all costs, right? That's like our whole kind of vaccination philosophy is viruses kill. Um, so it turns out maybe that certain viruses may be really helpful. And actually, in this particular study, which was in Nature at the end of last year, this Muri norovirus, when introduced into the gut of germ-free mice, actually took over for the microbiome of bacteria and without a blip, okay? There were no problems. 
the gut wall was healthy, everything worked as it was supposed to because of murine norovirus. And this is preliminary and early, but it's very impressive. I mean, I really think this is a landmark paper as far as understanding that the microbiome is a much more diverse uh, community than we really liked we really like to consider or have considered. It turns out also that some of these viruses um, may protect us from cancer. So there's this whole m different layer too that people who have um, had mumps in childhood have um, half the risk of developing ovarian cancer later in life um, in, in a couple of studies and that there are certain antigens that seem to trigger our immune systems to target cancer. Um, and similarly, measles virus, which is now kind of the new darling of, as an oncolytic, is actually um, identifying and it, uh, helping our immune systems to identify and attack um, tumor cells, which are um, high in CD46 receptors. And somehow, basically, as we're talking about, um, the avoid philosophy may not be as helpful, and kind of this meet and greet philosophy helps our immune system develop social skills and know who belongs and who doesn't in the body, how to take care of and maintain its terrain. Parasites, those bad, nasty, nasty worms, may actually have a role in protecting us against autoimmune conditions and metabolic conditions like type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So it turns out in this aboriginal study, and there's actually several others, um, the people who had, um, who had infection with these worms, essentially these parasites, had 60% um, less likelihood of having type 2 diabetes, even though type 2 diabetes is very, very broad, um, very, very common in this population. And actually, another study looked at type 1 diabetes and found that, um, so our upper picture is where there's a lot of type 1 diabetes, and our lower picture is where the red is where there's a lot of endemic parasitic infection. Um, so. It's certainly interesting, okay? I don't think it's an answer. I don't think it's definite. I don't think we should all be going out and trying to, like, you know, ingest parasites at this particular point in time. Um, but I also think we need to be really careful because I know that a lot of people in integrative medicine, not just conventional medicine, are into this attack of, oh, this person has parasites. They have, you know, uh, overgrowth of this. They ha you know, and I'm not saying we don't have to address that and we don't have to treat it. But I think we need to start thinking in a more complex way. Even here in this um, paper also from late last year, we talked about, or here they talked about, um, the relationship between humans and nematodes of the digestive tract can be considered as a mutualism rather than a typical parasitism, okay? So this is really starting to come forth, that it has more to do with the person who has the disease than it has to do with the disease itself. And in this study, looking at gluten challenges and celiac, um, hookworm actually increased diversity of microbes. So no hookworm, hookworm. And all the little blue dots up at the top show there was richer biodiversity in the gut. So how can food reverse or prevent cell danger response? <clears throat> so food is the embodiment of our terrain. Okay, we eat animals and plants, animals live on plants, plants live on soil, sun, water, and rocks, and microbes, and mycorrhizae, and all these other complex organisms, um, including what we think of as pests, right, are basically facilitating nutrition for the plants and for us. Nutritional depletion makes us vulnerable to illness. We need reserve, and reserve is really nourishment, okay? And um, nutrient density creates resilience. And I think nutrients include things like microbes and include things like dirt and soil. I think we have to really broaden our idea of what nutrients really are. So we need to think about the quality of our food and ask ourselves these questions. We need to think about what is nutrition. When we're eating plants, we're getting soil if we're eating the right kinds of plants from the right places. We're getting stem cells and pheromones and microbes and very diverse phytonutrients, okay? It's not just about like protein and fat and, you know, magnesium. And I'm not saying those, you know, are not important. They're important, but they're not all it is. <laughs> um, so geosmin is the odor produced by microbes in the soil as they break down plants. 
Who right now can imagine the smell of soil? Okay, go there for a second. That is geosmin. And basically, it's a smell of microbes. It's the cloud, it's the aura of microbes of soil, okay? And, and that's where we taste the flavor of life in beets and carrots and the terroir, the sourdough from France versus the sourdough from, um, you know, San Francisco. And it turns out soil organisms actually make us happy. Okay, so there's a study looking at a certain strain of a soil bacteria, and, and it turned out when injected into cancer patients that they had improved symptoms and also improved emotional health, mood, cognition, and so on. And, and actually in another study, it showed that it lowered stress in an animal study. And in yet another study, when they put it on a little mini peanut butter jelly sandwich for the mice, um, so this time it wasn't injected, actually they navigated a difficult maze twice as fast and exhibited half of the anxiety behaviors. And we need constant exposure because the superhero effect, as they called it, lasted only three weeks. And then they just went back to being, you know, Clark Kent. <laughs> so eating organic is actually important because we don't want to be getting all the antibiotics and all the pesticides that are killing um, the microbiome. So we want to eat real food. And what is that? Um, fermented foods and taking care of your microbiome that way. Drinking raw milk and actually um, because people think that this is like a deadly weapon, I just included a couple, okay, and that means, okay, it's certified, it's certified, state certified raw milk, um, perhaps, and, and make sure you tolerate the milk and all of this. But there are studies um, basically showing that in babies, okay, so there's two studies, the Gabriella study and the Pasture study, that um, showed that raw milk, um, when babies drank it, uh, they had 30% fewer infections, they had fewer um, fevers, ear infections, and their CRP was lower than their counterparts. And in another study showed fewer allergies and less asthma and hay fever. So that is the pasture study. That is the Gabriella study. No children were harmed in the making of these studies. Um, eat plants. I don't know why she's wearing gloves. I'm gonna have to change that picture. Get those gloves off, kid. Um, but when you're doing that, you know, getting all those rich phytonutrients, um, getting soil and all of that. Raw honey, which I just love to kind of like flip everything on its head. So it turns out raw honey actually is being looked at as a treatment for type 1 diabetes. So for everyone who's like, no, we can't have sugar, we can't have any sweet, we can't. I'm not saying, you know, guzzle raw honey, although I had a girl at my table today for lunch and she ate half of a jar of raw honey right in front of my face, um, which was, <laughs> like, what's going on there? But, um, but in a study, actually, this is, this, there are several studies, and so it's quite fascinating. Um, in a study with metformin, okay, metformin alone and metformin and raw honey, it turned out that um, blood glucose levels were much lower and insulin was better maintained with both the raw honey and the metformin together. So um, we really need to start, again, thinking differently. And honey is like very rich with pollen. It's rich with micronutrients. And um, it's also, um, you know, it's also full of phytonutrients. Blackstrap molasses, it turns out a serving of blackstrap molasses um, is higher in antioxidants than blueberries, serving of blueberries. So everything's connected, soil health, plant health, animal health all of them together. Dr. William Albrecht, who was this amazing soil scientist, um, has been lo had been looking at that for many years, has written many very interesting books about it. And um, he really like charted it all out that, you know, when you have less soil fertility, you have sicker people. Um, and I just want to bring in like this idea of being afraid of outside, okay, because it turns out that we really need light and sunshine in order to develop our eyes. There's this huge epidemic of myopia in um, Korea and in, the, in Asia, and um, like 97% of young men are nearsighted. And they know this because there's like only a certain number of eye doctors and like, you know, they, they can't manage all of these people. And um, it turns out, how many hours a day do you need to be outside in order to prevent this from happening, ideally? Guess. Three hours. Three hours a day, outdoors. Okay. Um, time in nature is actually incredibly healing. It enhances um, hospital patients looking out the window at trees. That's all, okay? 
more favorable recovery, lower hospital stays, lower complications, um, fewer negative comments, less analgesics, and so on. Um, reduces pain and anxiety in the dentist's chair. If you have a picture of nature, I mean, we're talking, we're not even talking about the microbiome here. We're talking about some much deeper connection. Um, children who play in highly na natural school playgrounds have um, fewer attention and concentration problems and improved cognitive and physical functioning than those playing on less natural playgrounds. And that includes better executive functioning. And I don't know if anyone here treats children, but I know that like so many kids are put on medication because of poor executive function. Throw those kids outside for God's sake, you know, because like a few hours a day outside would probably get like 75 or more percent of ch children off of their medication. And it enhances cognition. So there's this idea called Shinrin-yoku, which is um, forest bathing. And it's practiced in Japan and in Asia, and they do a lot of research on basically this idea that natural killer cells are incredibly boosted, as well as anti-cancer proteins um, and reducing cortisol and all kinds of amazing things that basically happen um, outside in the forest if you go and immerse yourself in the forest. So that is preventive medicine in Japan and the ocean. So dirt, eat it, grow food in it, bathe in it. Okay, when I wrote my book, The Dirt Cure, um, I really fought with the publisher about the title because they were disgusted. They told me they recoiled when they heard the word dirt. They said, it sounds like you're gonna tell children to eat dirt. And I was like, I am. <laughs> so I think our choice is between this and this. Thank you. All right. I'm going to take it back. That was great, Maya. Thank you so much. I'm going to take it back on the wine. I like the energy in here now. This is, we're getting there. The wine is, is it's, a, it's a net positive. And there's some uh, people enjoying it on Twitter. We've had some awesome Twitter banter already. Kim uh, Chartrand says, uh, I signed up for Liberty Direct Health Share last month, dumped Kaiser. She's very excited about that. You know what's also awesome? You know, we've had meetups in a while in the places that you'd expect to have functional forum meetups, right? Portland, Austin, Miami, Boston, Toronto, like all the, you know, Atlanta, big places. Now, like we got people coming in from Springfield, Missouri. Shout out to you guys. Columbus, Ohio, the middle of the country where we really need this to get to. It's so exciting that it's getting there because there ain't no functional medicine conferences in St. Louis, Missouri. I'll tell you that right now. But there is one happening right now, and it's in Dr. Ken Sharlin's office. Thanks, Ken, for putting it on, and I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. I'm just going to. Um, Pop onto the next slide, that was awesome, wasn't it? Thank you so much, Maya. Let's have a, a, a round of applause. So we keep the banter going on Twitter. We like having the questions and the thoughts here. So I just want to say one thing here now. There's an awkward part in TV shows where we have these things called commercials, right? And you know, in the same way that Craigslist really killed newspapers because it took all the ad revenue away, I think the same thing's going to happen to TV. And that's why we've tried to go ahead of the curve and not have commercials in our show, but actually add value to the consumer with what we offer from our partners. So this is apparently quite a good idea because someone else likes it, and it's the Integrated Health Symposium. So this is New York's Integrative Medicine Conference. It's the biggest integrative conference in the, uh, in the Northeast. And this is really one of the things that drove my excitement. The first time I heard Jeff Bland sp uh, speak there, I was like, man, this really has legs. This movement has legs because there's enough science to back it up. This is a holism machine that is being finely tuned for the future. So anyway, they've got, you've got your classic Hyman, Bland, Pearl Mutter combination that's pretty much every year, but they're all <laughs> awesome lecturers. But I just want to you know, say a couple people here. This guy, Dan Craft. Has anyone ever heard him speak? This guy is like a genius. Uh, he's the head, he's the medical head of Singularity University. He's also uh, runs the Future Med Conference. He's the headliner this year because functional, the IHS wants to be basically the conference that's looking at the cross section of technology and functional medicine. I guess, well, I wonder where they got that idea. Um, so basically the 27th, 24th to the 27th, I can't really say we're taking over that conference because that's not true, but we will have our own suite upstairs. We can come and hang out, and we're going to be featuring some of the technologies um, that we think hold the key to streamlining and making more efficient uh, the practice of functional and integrated medicine. 
which is absolutely necessary. So I'm going to take you through some of these today. And this is the advertising section, but I think you're going to see that, this, that we've got some killer uh, sponsors for this season of Functional Forum. So first, we're going to talk about five technologies that can help with what we're calling patient compliance, but it's really empowerment. Get this. Igbo. GoEvoMed.com slash Igbo. This is Uber for phlebotomists. <laughs> Let that sink in. Let that sink in. Right. So you're a doctor. You give a medical test. And guess what? 50% of your patients don't do it. On average, 50% of patients will not go to the third party place to go and get their blood drawn, and they're not gonna come back in to see your phlebotomist, and 50% of people don't do the test. That is a big problem. Igbo solves that problem. You can go onto Igbo, you can recommend the test, and you can have their little Iggies. It's only in 20 cities right now, but it's gonna grow all across the country so quickly because it's so awesome. Is the little Iggies go in their little Uber type thing, and you've got the app, and you can book the mobile phlebotomist to go to their house, to go to their office, or to come to yours. And guess what? Neither the patient or the doctor pays. The lab pays for the whole thing. Boom, 98% <laughs> compliance. 98% compliance with lab tests. Igbo is coming, and it's, it's awesome, especially for the more advanced tests you're doing. Go to Igbo, sign up as a provider. If you go to goevomed.com slash Igbo, they'll know you came from us, and it'll be good for us, and it'll be good for you. So you'll see a pattern here because we have goevomed.com slash, and these are all of our sponsors, so make sure you use those links. The next one, Chiron Health. We've done a couple of sessions with Chris Cresser. Look, Telemedicine is such a no-brainer right now. There's not enough functional doctors to go around, and the doctors that are doing it need to have telemedicine so they can serve people that aren't in the 30 miles around their practice. Chiron, you know, there's literally 150 telemedicine companies, and you guys don't have time to do 150 demos. We did it. We looked for the ones that the geeky, awesome practitioners, and Chris wouldn't mind me calling him that because he's a bit of a tech geek, but he's also very smart, and he used a couple. He used Skype not HIPAA compliant, please don't do, don't do that. You use Zoom, other things, but Chiron basically recreates the medical experience, the waiting room, all the things that you need, and, it's, and there's, there's uh, customer services off the chain. Again, just take a demo. It really helps us if you take a demo. Go evomed.com slash Chiron, take a demo and check it out. It's, this is massively increasing the, uh, the efficiency of functional medicine delivery, which is exactly what we need. Bodysite.com, who gives a recommendation for a diet or an exercise program or otherwise and just says, go do the Mediterranean diet. That could work, but I think a lot of times it doesn't work. And what Bodysite does is essentially is essentially take whatever protocol that you have and they help to get compliance with it by essentially having patients, they, it sends out a whole program to them. Like if you tell people to change their diet, think of all the things that has to happen before their diet actually changes. Their shopping list has to change, right? All of these things have to change. You have to go a lot of upstream factors. BodySite helps to do that. So go evomed.com slash BodySite, check it out. Healthwave, we've been on the Healthwave tip for a while. I think this is a best in category technology for supplements. They're ahead of the game when it comes to e-prescribing. I think e-prescribe is gonna be the future of supplements. As supplements become a part of medicine, we gotta stop acting like it's not. And I think that once they are, they'll be prescribed. And Healthwave is offering now 40% margin, which is 10% above any of their competitors because they want your business and they're very good. And all of our geeky technology people lose them too. And Freedom Practice Coaching is our last sponsor. They were a sponsor last year. And I just want to tell you one story. This happened at IFM this year, which was amazingly gratifying for so many reasons. So we met a doctor at the IFM this year that had never heard of functional medicine, family physician, watched the functional forum, never heard of anything, just watched it one night, watched a clip, watched one, got hooked, watched all of them, like watched all of our back catalog, and then went on a call with Gabe and organized uh, to go to Freedom Practice Coaching, started running their program, and four months after watching her first video, has an active, successful functional medicine practice. That is what we've been trying to do since the beginning, is make that path so clear that doctors can start to do this, and it takes partners like these guys who have a system that can do it. So if you want to go down to one of their boot camps, go evomed.com slash FPC. You notice the pattern? It's very easy to follow. All right. 
so now, uh, if you have more questions, we're going to carry on with the Twitter banter here. Um, you know, I was uh, chatting with Dr. Jerry uh, last month, Dr. Jerry Curatola, and he was telling me that he'd seen a study where they saw that, that if you had effective dentistry, it could bring down the cost of, of medicine, the total cost by a significant amount. I think it was like 20%. What was that, Jerry? 21% by having effective dentistry. Now, dentistry is an area. We got a bunch of dentists in the house tonight. I'm really excited to have you. Thank you much for being here. Um, and, uh, and so it's my great pleasure. You know, before there was the functional forum a long time ago when Gabe and I were doing events just in front of a few people in a yoga studio three blocks that way. Um, uh, one of our biggest fans and a consistent supporter of everything that we've done was Dr. Reed Winnick, and um, I'm really excited to bring here on the forum. So please, a round of applause for Dr. Winnick. <laughs> I didn't say anything yet. Okay. Um, First, I want to thank um, Gabe and James for inviting me to speak today um, and be part of, of the microbiome conversation as it relates to all of our patients' health. Um, also, I feel it's important that we note the date. Today is October 5th, and I'm a big fan. If you're going to quote me, then date me also, because what I say today, probably in a year or two, will probably be all wrong. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk about microbes, and there are good microbes and there are bad microbes. Um, you know, my feeling is the reality is that it's really the body's or the person's choice or ability to resist these microbes by living a healthy life and being strong. I don't think microbes just come out of the closet one day and attack you. I think they're with us all the time. So our goal in the next few years is really to teach our patients to to grow and be healthy like you did with our children today. I think it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to be talking about the oral systemic link. You can't separate the oral systemic link from the microbiome. The microbiome is basically uh, in the mouth, and the oral systemic link talks about how the microbes in the mouth affect distal parts of the body, whether it's the heart, the pancreas for diabetes, uh, the brain for Alzheimer's disease. So the oral, stem, oral systemic link is the microbiome. Um, the oral systemic link is the driving force of how to bridge the gap between medicine and dentistry. Names like Weston Price, Royal Lee, Charles Mayo are the early pioneers of the oral systemic link. They are the ones who knew there was something causing hidden inflammation. Today, with new technologies to identify pathogens, like DNA testing, and the further understanding of the microbiome, these pioneers have passed the torch onto all of us to continue educating ourselves as the community of the detrimental effects of systemic inflammation and the benefits we can derive from understanding of the microbiome. However, today I am proposing that we take hidden out of the phrase hidden inflammation. The game of hide and seek is over. The technology available to us proves it. It's also my wish that with the science behind the microbiome, we embrace dentistry and medicine as a team to better serve our patients and fight systemic inflammation. Now, normally we have a whole conversation about what I call the oral inflammatory triangle. Um, we only have a 15 minutes or so today, so we're just going to discuss how the pathogens in the mouth affect distal parts of the body. And we still have a lot to learn about the microbiome. The way I understand it, we can destroy the microbiome with such things as chemotherapy and antibiotics. And we build up the microbiome <clears throat> with pre and probiotics, and we allow it to thrive by creating a healthy, systemic environment in which the microbes are balanced by our body's innate wisdom to heal. It is when this balance is affected do we start to see disease. Today we're going to touch on what I call sustainable dentistry, and we're going to briefly go over the dental ecosystem, the mouth as a barometer for overall wellness, and the future of salivary diagnostics. So, 
there are benefits to the microbiome. So in the mouth, there is specific bacteria that break down nitrates to nitrites, and that's how we produce nitric oxide, which is used uh, in one way to protect our heart. Um, the rub on this whole thing is where there's now research showing that by doing um, strong oral mouth rinses, we're killing off those bacteria that create this nitric oxide. So in essence, the mouth rinse can be giving us our heart, you know, heart disease. The question I have, and which we're looking into now, is are these spe specific herbal mouth rinses, which are from the earth, does the, are they only going to attack the bad bacteria and leave their friends alone? Also, the way the microbiome is a friend of ours is by introducing um, Streptococcus salivarius, you can actually minimize the possibility of your kids having uh, strep throat or uh, otitis media. So this is where we have a balance of different microbes helping each other. The earth has an ecosystem, the human body has an ecosystem, and the mouth has its own ecosystem. It's my belief we are all governed by the same laws of nature that govern the tree. We resemble the tree with our intestines like its roots and our teeth like its leaves. What I see is that both the leaves and our teeth act as a barometer for their overall health and wellness. So when a patient comes into the office and I see that they're breaking down, I can have them open the mouth and take a look. I can't have them open up their intestines and see what's happening. So the mouth is your first guide that there is something going on with your patients. And we'll touch more on that um, a, a little later on too. Oh, one point I wanted to say. It's the microbes that are important for the soil of a tree. So just giving the tree nutrients and ig ignoring the microbes isn't going to help the tree thrive. And the same thing with us. And, and this, this study just shows that it, we're no longer looking clinically at the mouth for bleeding gums. Now we need to look at the bacteria in the mouth because the bacteria produce inflammatory cytokines. And that's the future of, of dentistry and medicine. Uh, this study just shows, again, how the oral cavity affects distal parts of the body. So they found these are pretty much um, many of the aggressive pathogens in the gums, and they found these bugs in different um, athro atheromas and plaques in patients who had uh, heart disease and heart surgery. Um, Porphyromonas gingivalis is very invasive, but it's also highly intelligent. It actually can uh, increase inflammation, and it also causes dysbiosis by affecting cell membranes. So it's no longer a question, is there an association, be association between heart disease and gum disease? It, the research has showed it. And when they talk level A evidence, that's the strongest evidence you can have. So I think what separates us from um, the allopathic medicine model is that they look at signs and symptoms, disease and dysfunction, where I think the common thread that ties us together is we look for the dysfunction, disease, which causes signs and symptoms. So where an allopath will look for a high blood pressure causing a stroke and the dysfunction is they can't talk or they're in a wheelchair, we act like um, detectives. And we're always looking, well, what's causing that problem? What's the dysfunction going on before we get to disease and signs and symptoms? So what we need to understand is that if someone has a heart attack tomorrow, it didn't occur today, you know, it didn't happen today. So we're all sitting out here in the audience, and we have some dysfunction going on that needs to be addressed and identified. And that's where we all come in as, as detectives. So this is something that I, I, this is something I found, and it was really a, 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 a macro model for me of this whole dysfunction, disease, and signs and symptoms. And it was interesting because it compares the, the allopathic model to what we, we, we did. And 
I'm a dentist, so you're going to have to see teeth, okay? That's just the way it is. But what's interesting is if you look over here, you see bone, right, dentist? And the patient's chief complaint was he had pus coming out of his chin for about four years. And he didn't know what it was. He would wear a beard, a beard like James's to cover it up. <laughs> but it wasn't James. It's, I can tell you it's not James, okay? But you can imagine how frustrated he was. He had, then it will heal up, and then it would come back. And he went to the dermatologist. They would give him antibiotics to try to, to clear this up. And from a dental point of view, you look at it, and you see nothing there. But that's where you need to become a detective. Because he also had a little swelling under his tongue right behind where that little uh, infection was. So we decided to take a CAT scan of it. And if you can read a CAT scan, you can notice right over here, had an extra tooth. So for, four, for years, and finally, for, you know, he had this extra tooth that was causing the drainage and the pus. And I don't bring it up to show you that this technology is great with the CAT scan. It is. But it shows you have to always be asking the question, what's causing this? There's a reason behind every problem, and we need to be detectives. We need to find the dysfunction that's causing our patients' problems. Tomography is another way. It's an early detector of inflammation and, and disease processes in the body and stagnation. So if, if you would go to a, a parasite doctor and they'd say, oh, I found an amoeba, it would look something like this, okay? It's only a half hour slide video, so. <laughs> okay, and what's around it is all these little spirochetes. Now, um, if you hear spirochetes, you think Lyme disease, right? So this is just a whole bunch of spirochetes gone, gone crazy, okay? Now, this wasn't in a stool sample. This was in someone's mouth. So this is what you would need to do to be a detective because if someone has this, you need to identify it. And every time I find a person who has an amoeba in the mouth, 100% of the time they've got parasites in the gut. Why? Because the gut and the mouth are attached and it needs to be addressed. So when you treat a patient like this, right, you're, everyone's treating the gut because they have parasites, you need to look to see in, in the mouth what they have. In the same way, the dentists who identify these, these pathogens, they need to send to the doctor to do a stool sample and find out how to clean the entire system and how to then boost the immune system so that the body can deal with this uh, type of pathogen. So one technique that we use to be detective, we use the microscope. It's very quick. It's, it's, it's equivalent to your quick strep test. And you can see quickly what's going on with the patient. And that's where those samples came from. Just looking in the patient's mouth, you do a little quick swab under the gums and you can find out what's going on. I bring this slide up also because it's more teeth, but also because <laughs> if you look at this patient and you understand her gums, they're swollen like balloons, okay? And they wanted to extract her teeth. And when I saw her, I was so excited. I'm like, I got my microscope and I'm going to find bacteria, but there was nothing. Because what we discovered from being a detective and learning about dysfunction, dysfunction was she had nutritional problems. You know, she wasn't getting enough protein or she wasn't absorbing protein. So we bridged that gap between dentistry and medicine and we sent it to the nutritionist. They did a workup and they got her on a good source of protein and other nutrients so that she can then save her teeth and be healthier, not just in her mouth, but her whole body. So when you're looking at your patients, they don't have to look like this and you say, okay, now I know you have a problem. They can look like this also because these bugs are hiding, and it takes certain tools to find them, okay? One tool is a test called oral DNA. It is a spit test, and you just look at, um, you just spit into a tube, and it gives you the pathogens that are associated with gum disease and the other oral systemic problems. So if you have a patient who has cardiovascular markers, and you can't understand why they have these markers for cardiovascular disease, this is a test you can do on your patients. Okay? Some of those, those um, bacteria that are, are considered the most aggressive, 
I'm not going to say this first word. We're just going to call it A. <laughs> AA, okay? But you'll find that most of gum disease is transmissible through kissing, sharing utensils, okay? Um, that bug is tissue invasive. It creates a toxin called leukotoxin that damages cell walls. It also produces nitric oxide to uh, keep itself viable, and it helps it to increase, actually increase and make more inflammation. Fusobacterium nucleatum is very smart. What it does is it punches holes in the epithelial lining so that it can then become invasive, but then all the other bacteria and viruses and fungus associated with it can also come in and create havoc in the rest of the body. And then you have that other bacteria, Porphyrmonas gingivalis, which is also transmissible and invasive. And we discussed that earlier. And we can also do with salivary diagnostics, um, we can do um, genetic testing. Because how do you determine if a person is genetically marked to have a disease or if it's nutrition? So it helps guide the doctor as to what direction they should go in. Um, basically, dentistry can help save patients' lives. We can improve upon the endothelium by cleaning the, uh, the, the infection up in the mouth. Okay? But here's the key. Okay? Um, we know that the bacteria is associated with heart attacks but we know also that we need to have an integrated approach bridging the gap between medicine and dentistry. You all, I'm assuming everyone's gone to the dentist and they've had scaling and root planning, right? This is the old way because the bugs have gotten so intelligent or we've gotten so intelligent, we now know that when you put these devices to clean the teeth, the bugs scatter. They hide back in the tissue, they hide back in the teeth, and then six weeks later, when the coast is clear, they come back and they start their process of inflammation all over again. So the new way would be, for instance, using lasers. Lasers will decontaminate the tissue, but it will not cut, cut away the tissue. And it's an effective way of dealing with these microbes. Other ways that are effective would actually be systemic antibiotics, but as we discussed earlier, I'm not a big fan of systemic antibiotics. So you can use systemic herbals also to deal with, with these, um, these microbes. Uh, a talk by myself is never complete unless I discuss floss because I'm a dentist. Uh, how many bacteria do you think you can kill with a piece of string? Okay. The reality is, unless you have food caught in your teeth, flossing is a waste of time. It does nothing, nothing to treat gum disease. Okay, okay we, we, got, we can move on? Okay. Okay. And in conclusion, the, uh, the microbiome is not about holistic dentistry or functional medicine. It's about the science and the medicine. Part of the Hippocratic Oath says, I will not be ashamed to say, I know not, nor will I fail to call in my colleagues when the skills of another are needed for a patient's recovery. It is now time to bridge the gap between dentistry and medicine to better serve our patients. Thank you very much. Woo! Awesome read. Thanks so much. Thanks, dude. Listen. Uh, for those people who are out there doing meetups, invite some dentists. IAOMT.org has a good list of holistic dentists. But look, every holistic dentist that I've ever met is packed. And I can't, for the life of me, fathom why more dentists don't move in this way. I think maybe it's a guilt thing or they can't admit that maybe they were doing things wrong, like putting mercury in people's mouths. Um, but, you know, admit it, come to one of the meetups, change your practice, be successful. Don't kill so many lions, that's the thing. All right, so, um, <coughs> so we're gonna get on to the next phase here. And I just wanna say, you know, parasites is an interesting conversation because just today it was confirmed that a TCM re uh, researcher from China won the Nobel Prize. Did you guys hear that? 
Chinese medicine researcher for artemisin, which I know is probably one of the herbs that you were talking about, won the Nobel Prize for medicine today. So um, it's a big shout out to the TCM community. So we're about to have our panel here. If we can have uh, our, um, you know, help bring on the chairs, we're going to have uh, Dr. Winnick and Dr. Shriek Kleiner joining us uh, all the way from Johns Hopkins University is Dr. Jerry Mullen and from just up the road, Donna James. Welcome. <laughs> questions uh, from the audience let me know if you have a question put your hand up and I'll come around to you in a minute um, and uh, we can also take questions if you're watching live uh, anywhere you are um, send in your questions via Twitter and you can ask any of these fine looking people here I want to start with you dr. Mullen because you are uh, the food MD talking about you've got this new book um, the gut balance revolution which is great you guys should check it out it's right here gut balance revolution I got a pre copy thanks Lauren um, so if you ask for, a particular so commercial yeah <laughs> if you uh, if you ask a good question you might, I might just give you this as well um, but I want to I want to ask you first how is an organization like Johns Hopkins which is so esteemed dealing with this massive transformation of understanding about microbes well it's very interesting that we actually have a consortium of 50 investigators uh, that have come together under Dean Rothman so we have a microbiomes uh, interest group with different investigators different clinical researchers all having a strong interest in the microbiome so they're at the cutting edge actually of all this I'm proud to say so and how, how do you um, in your practice there maybe practicing slightly different from other gastroenterologists. I mean, I've sort of made fun in the past on this show that gastroenterologists sort of missed that there was 100 trillion microbes in their organ of choice. Um, so what's happening in, in gastroenterology? Well, in our, in our practice, we do recognize the fact that the GI tract intimately has a systemic association with illness. And many of us take a functional medicine approach to that. Um, at Hopkins, maybe not as many as others, but I think there's a transformation that's happening um, you know, across our society where we do have this recognition about the gut being really the, the mother of the body and that we need to nurture it and take care of it very well. Absolutely, yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's a good thing. Yeah, do you wanna, let's, Dr. Cortez, you go. So, treating something like uh, ulcerative colitis you would treat then, how? Excuse me? Ulcerative colitis. Yes. You would still, even if the hematocrit's down at 13, you still hospitalize and you still consider uh, sectioning? Or would you be treating as a microbiome? Well, we have to look at all illness as a, a spectrum and, and stage of illness. And someone who's got the active bleeding and severe ulcerative colitis needs certainly monitoring and management that, in, that does require anti-inflammatory medications acutely. So that would be, you know, for someone who has an emergency like that, that's how you would manage that acutely. But long term, obviously, we're talking about more preventive medicine and more long term approaches to people that would certainly include the microbiome. There's ample data showing how probiotics do help maintain ulcerative colitis and remission, even does treat acute ulcerative colitis that's moderately active, not severely active. Mm -hmm. You can reverse it. Thank you. A little, uh, you can reverse it under your, uh, uh, you, you had the mic, so everyone heard that at home, but yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Don, I want to ask you a question here, because you are the food coach, you are working with people, to actually coach people, you know, a lot of people are sort of starting to understand about the microbiome, because it's everywhere. How do you, um, you know, how do you, how do you eat for an optimal microbiome? So it's really interesting. What I'm seeing is that all of a sudden we've gone from worrying about what we're supposed to eat to what our microbiome is supposed to eat. And, and just as there isn't one particular diet for all of us, there's going to be a various array of diets for your microbiome as well, just depending on what you're actually working on. And so if somebody, if, if you've decided through your functional medicine skills that somebody needs to be in, on a ketogenic diet, then you're going to guide them through that for a short period of time. Or you might decide that um, the appropriate diet is much more of a plant-based diet. And then, and then you guide them on that. And 
here's what, being a nutritionist, I have the luxury of having time with my clients to really talk them through things. So it's not as James just alluded to before when he was talking about the, the app, the body site. Like, like if you say the paleo diet, like what do people think? Tons of meat. Yeah, ton, tons of meat and and not necessarily grass-fed meat. Somehow it just sort of gets skipped or it's like lots of paleo treats made with almond butter and they come in with a really depleted diet where it's like chicken breast for, bre for breakfast and, and maybe it's a burger without the bun at lunchtime and then some other type of fish in the evening with maybe some steamed broccoli and they're wondering why things just aren't functioning for them. And so it's being really precise about what you want them to eat and I do work with a I do work with a strong woman demographic and so they appeal to things that are pretty and so make the food sound pretty make it really visual for them so I'll just run through it a day like we'll just uh, a, you know a microbiome enhanced day um, so you might start the day with a shot of coconut kefir and in that one shot of coconut kefir, like a little capful, you have 15 billion CFUs, 15 billion. Then you might have a smoothie made with pea protein. So pre pea protein has been shown to increase the bifida bacteria and the lactobacillus as well. And you might make that with almond milk and then... I love the combination of cherries and, and beets. You have this sort of nice, nice sort of earthy uh, mixture with the sweetness of that. So you've got this, this, this robust and beautiful uh, red colored smoothie. And then you might go into lunch and lunch would be a salad with, with kale for Drew, Dr. Drew Ramsey and then arugula with uh, avocado and pumpkin seeds and, and uh, snow pea sprouts and maybe your grass fed beef. And if anybody here, I think that a lot of everybody's based, or quite a few of you are based in Manhattan, there's a place that I just discovered that delivers to all of Midtown called the Butcher's Block. And this, the salad that I just described, that's it, that was there. I was like, oh my goodness, wow. And there were sprouts and other things in it. And then in the afternoon, you might be saying, let's have some berries and a kombucha if you want something a little bit sweet and you're okay with that. Um, and then for dinner, it could be halibut over some, um, so, some eggplant, since eggplant is a, a prebiotic. And then maybe some asparagus with some, some chili flakes and some lemon zest. So you make it sound really good for them. And then I go through a couple of days and then I have them repeat a day. They can't use any of the examples that I've used. So it has to be practical for them. Yeah. Hang on, you've got to just use the mic so people can hear. It's Sorry. Your food doesn't have a lot of chewability. You're not exercising your muscles. You're not exercising the TMJ. You're not exercising the cervical. The only thing you got to was the asparagus and halibut that had any bite. Everything else is too smooth. So I think some of you are even talking about chewing your, your liquids. You. I think kale is quite chewy. Yeah, but um, that's about <laughs> it. The rest of it wasn't. <laughs> yes. You could put in chia seed or something like that if you want that. So you'll decide what's appropriate for your particular client or patient. Good stuff. Jerry, tell us a little bit. I know I read your book and I, I've seen some of the, uh, some of the, uh, that is there. I know you, you're mainly a, a, a Mediterranean man. What are some of your Mediterranean uh, favorite things? Mediterranean man. Yeah. That sounds brandable. <laughs> Whatever, what, what are some of the, uh, the, the sort of microbiome feeding foods that are integrative gastroenterologist approved? Well, we all love yogurt and kefir, but the problem is is that the yogurts that you kind of buy that are out there are certainly ultra pasteurized and they're really microbial deficient <laughs> by and large. So it's sometimes it's better to really make your own. It's more robust uh, when you make your own. And certainly with the kefir, I was very privileged to have dinner last night with my friend Lauren Marks here. And here he was very proud to show me how he was making his own kefir. He goes, you got to try this. You got to try this. Really microbial rich, better than the kefirs I had that are certainly uh, commercially available. So I have to tip my hat off to the docs who do their own thing, like, like Lauren. But I think those are the two. There's certainly a sauerkraut, the pickles, uh, pickled vegetables that you showed on the screen before. Maya, I mean, there's, there's so many different options that we have 
to nurture our microbiome. So those are amongst my favorites. Awesome. I'm just going to go. We've got a couple of questions from Twitter here. Um, do anti T, this is from Patty, uh, Patty Carter. She says, do anti TNF meds for autoimmune change the microbiome to be more, to be healthier um, or, or not? Well, I, I don't think there's studies on that, but I can't imagine how they'd be a help since, <laughs> the, since they're, since they're, if you want to use the word poisoning, since they're really disarming our immune system to a large extent, they're really dampening the response to the microbes and certainly not rebuilding certainly the gut immunity, certainly the gut itself or the microbes they're, they're in. So, I mean, they're, they're kind of, uh, you know, preventing more casualties of war, but they're not really rebuilding the infrastructure. So they're, they're really, you know, they're used, unfortunately, what they call top-down therapies, which is a, a way that medicine try to, pr it's a very good marketing that we'd kind of kill everybody or o overload everybody with these medications that are overkill, literally, to, to shut down a response no matter what the spectrum is and not reserve them for emergencies or reserve them for the worst case scenarios they're given to practically everybody. And the marketing spin is called top-down therapy. Mm -hmm. And of course it's gonna work for the vast majority of people because you're overwhelming the immune system and you're shutting it down. But in the meantime, the, the microbes themselves, they're, they're really not correcting the underlying problem or the root cause. Interesting. I, I spoke to a doctor this weekend in Toronto, and he said something genius. He said, when people come in with their meds, ask them, if someone was well and took all the things that you're taking, what would happen to their health? That's a really good barometer. It's a good question to ask people as they go along. You got a question? Uh, I have a question for Dr. Shetrine Klein. Um, as a pediatric neurologist, I'm curious what your response or your reaction is to the fact that at the uh, Republican debate, Dr. Carson, also a pediatric neurologist, and said in front of 23 million people that we are vaccinating too much too soon, and that as a result, some children are getting hurt. What's your response to that? Um, <clears throat> well, he's a neurosurgeon, actually, but... Um, right. <laughs> But I think it was really fascinating moment um, because, you know, I'm not sure how much was politically driven and how much was really based in um, the actual scientific literature. But I think what hopefully I showed was that this is a really nuanced conversation. And so every time somebody brings up any kind, I mean, did you see all the articles the next day. Yes, I did. Um, and how, you know, Republicans are anti-science, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, it really like uh, everywhere, I mean, the Atlantic, New York Times, I mean, everywhere. Um, and I kind of realized anti-science is actually, I think, an industry term, um, which is a PR term. And I think it is really about shutting down conversation. Um, mm -hmm. What I'm really in favor of is acknowledging that there's nuance and walking away, stepping away from dogma. Um, because science is not something you can be anti or for. It's about conversation, and it's about looking at literature, looking at change, looking at what's happening in front of your face. Um, so what I'm in favor of is having that conversation. So personally, I was delighted that it came up um, in the debate, but it's always so interesting to watch what the spin is. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm hoping to continue that conversation. Great, thank you. We've had a lot of questions on the on Twitter about what probiotics you guys use. So maybe I'm just going to go through and just you know <laughs> clinically soil based or whatever. Quick fire round. Some of your favorite probiotics for you know for uh, treating a wide range of issues. Pretty broad question. Hope you can be uh, pretty tight with the answers. Let me start with you, Maya, and we'll go down this way. Um, so I really think, you know, if we're talking about what's in things like yogurt and kefir, and I do make my own yogurt, so easy, so, so easy. Everyone should try it. Um, so I think things like that are great, and I actually think soil is great. I think soil-based organisms are great. Um, I think nature does a way better job than we do ever, um, really, with things that are complex. Um, and so I really try to, I mean, I have a garden, um, and I try to grow food and I keep chickens and I try to interact with the, the world around me and I actually think that is the best probiotic, um, better than any product. Good answer. We like that. Okay, Donna, what do you think? 
So there's a number of them out there, but I like Claire Labs, so I tend to use their Therbiotic Complete, which is a 12-strain probiotic. And sometimes I use a Dr. O'Hara's, which is a fermented food. Cool. Reed? Um, well, since uh, patients are always saying we have no time for anything, um, we always try to promote good food, you know, sauerkraut and other things they should be eating. Um, but we would give them a probiotic by mouth that, that they could take, but also we would give them a probiotic that they could uh, keep in their mouth. So after they do their oral home care, they can re reseed the mouth with healthy uh, bacteria. Dr. Bowden, I know there's a lot of interest in, in your thoughts on this. I agree with all my panelists, but there's one point I want to make about the Remicade is that evidence versus harm. And I'm writing a chapter for Dr. Rakel's book on integrative medicine on IBD. And we're looking at each therapy with the risk versus risk is a factor. So the Remicade is clearly a risk. So we have to look at it, the whole totality and the whole picture, but we always have to look at risk. Absolutely. All right. Uh, we got uh, time for one or two more questions here. Rika. Hi, Reed. Reed, I have a question for you. Great to see you on the panel. In any case, for thrush in the mouth, what do you recommend regarding the oral um, espolarity, breaking up the caps? What is it you would recommend, especially for chronic Lyme patients? Well, we would recommend something like um, an essential oil that could be very strong. Even uh, they can try to remove it with tongue scraping, but chances are that won't work, and that would be the telltale that it's a problem. Um, but if a patient has thrush on their tongue, then we figure they have some kind of IBS or some other issue going on, so we want them to see their integrative doctor to deal with that end of the problem. Also, if they have thrush in the mouth, they could be mercury toxic, because mercury will, uh, the, the, the fungus grows as a result of the mercury, because the fungus eats the mercury. So it's another symbiotic relationship that the body has. Hi, this question is for Dr. Winnick. I actually am a huge proponent of microbiotics, so I thought this would be a question for the whole panel, but my question is, what do you mean note floss? <laughs> I feel like I'm 12 years old. I've been telling people to floss forever. Well, so here's the deal. Everyone knows they should floss, but only 35% really floss, and I think most of them are hygienists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> The reality is, if, if you have an infection in your gums, number one, the infection is deep down in the pocket, where your floss can only go one or two millimeters to the top of the pocket. Second thing is, the bacteria that causes infection is anaerobic. So you don't find anaerobic bacteria up here, you found it down here. So again, it's great if you have food caught. If you want to floss, don't stop, okay? However, if you find out that you have an infection in your mouth, then there's more effective ways to deal with the infection. One way would be using a water pick or a hydrofloss, some kind of water irrigator. Or another way would be doing oil pulling. Oil pulling is very, very effective. But, um, and then you have certain clays and, and other herbal medicaments you can use that are antimicrobial. What we've learned, and we've studied this in the, in the office, is that no matter what you do at home, whether it's oil pulling or a good herbal mouth rinse, you still need to see the, we call them periotherapists, to break up the biofilm. Yeah. It's because nothing can pierce through that sludge and it needs to be broken up properly. And then you go on the home care and then you're golden. Love that. Hey, I'm sorry to say that we are running out of time because uh, we have to do it. And I know that Dr. Mullen has to take a train back to Baltimore. So I know there's a lot of questions. Maybe stay for some banter afterwards. But I'd love everyone to give a big round of applause to all of our panelists. Awesome stuff. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thanks, Dr. Mullen. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Reed. Really. Appreciate it. Donna, appreciate you. Um, I'll, give a, uh, I'll give the book to, uh, to Zoe just because that was an awesome question. And uh, I didn't get to see that Carson-Trump interaction live because we were doing something at ABC, but when I heard about it, I was very excited. So we just got one, we're just gonna take one more minute here. We're not done. Clara, sit down. Sit down, we're not done. We just got one, one little thing that I'm gonna talk about here because <clears throat> I just wanna finish off here, right? <clears throat> I'm not a doctor. 
I didn't start this because I'm a doctor. I started this because I got increasingly passionate over a period of time that this was the future of chronic disease management and the people in integrated medicine need to start acting like they're winning and not losing because this is the future. And so there's a massive inferiority complex. And so what I think that we need in order to get from where we are now to a situation where we have microbiome maximized medicine is a few things, five things I actually think. One, we need a massive re-education of the population about beneficial microbes microbes, right? And these creating tools like this, like this video will be available forever on the internet for free for anyone to look and you can recommend Dr. Shri Klein's talk or otherwise. But we need to create urgency about this because if we just wait until people are sick, it's too late. It's too late because then they're having to deal with it. Then they're finding out all about the microbiome. Why didn't someone tell us when I was well? That's a huge piece as well because you can't wait until people have a chronic disease, IBS, IBD or anything until they're too late. So um, we need to also take root cause resolution concepts from the fringe to the mainstream. You know, Dr. Brogan sort of coined it on Huffington Post when we were there together, root cause resolution medicine as a way to tie together integrated medicine, functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, all of the names that mean the same thing, but it's all about root cause resolution. And we need to engage, engage everyone that's passionate about this movement to align their work with their passion. Now, we have been able to do that with doctors. Doctors are switching and starting integrated micro practices. We've been able to do it with coaches coaches can now you can go and be a health coach and then you can work with one of these doctors and actually deliver this there is an opportunity for anyone who wants to be a clinician or a pseudo clinician to be able to operate but who how are we going to get everyone else the people who don't want to be doctors but want to align the work with their passion I think about this all the time because I know I meet speak to hundreds of them tens of thousands of them were signed up at the summit and left us messages like I really want to get involved I'm getting myself healthy what can I do so we need to create an economic engine to drive this movement because we need our own senators and we need our own lobbyists and we need people that can influence policy at that end and you don't get that from begging. We need an economic engine. And so one of those, and so what we need is something a little bit like this. Oh, actually, sorry, that was a big setup for the next thing. So look, <laughs> we, need, we need a billion dollars, right? We need a billion dollars, that's what we need. So I was listening to this article the other day, it was by Janice Musk, who's Elon Musk's wife. And she said something, and I think it's so important. She says, the world doesn't throw a billion dollars at a person because the person wants it and they work so hard they feel like deserve it. The world doesn't care what you want or deserve. The world gives you money in exchange for something that it perceives to be of equal or greater value, something that transforms an aspect of the culture, reworks a familiar story or introduces a new one, alters the way people think about the category and make sense of it in daily life. There's no roadmap, there's no blueprint. A lot of people will give you a lot of advice and most of it will be bad and a lot of it will be good and sound, but you'll have to figure out how it doesn't apply to you because you're coming from an unexpected angle. And you'll be doing it alone and until you develop the charisma and credibility to attract the talent you need to come with you. Have courage, you'll need it, and good luck, you'll need that too. We're so powerful about what we need to happen. And I thought, what do we need? We need something like this. Do you find yourself longing for the apocalypse? Do you find yourself longing for the apocalypse? I did. I was are looking for a reason to live. Hi. Are you feeling tired, nature. irritable, stressed out? Well, you might consider nature. From the people that brought you getting outside comes prescription strength nature, a non-harmful medication shown to relieve the crippling symptoms of modern life. Nature's recommended for humans of all ages, and it's great for pets too. Nature can reduce cynicism, meaninglessness, anal retentiveness, and murderous rage. In clinical studies, nature is proven to decrease work-induced catatonia. Caution. Nature may cause you to slow down, quit your job, or seriously consider what the f*** you're doing with your life. If you are overly cynical, jaded, or emotionally numb, you may need to increase your dose of nature. Do you have trouble being even mildly uncomfortable? Nature may not be right for you. Side effects may include spontaneous euphoria, taking yourself less seriously, and being in a good mood for no apparent reason. So ask your doctor. Right. So we need a nature right revolution. But there's no billion dollar price tag on nature, but there is this, and this is serious. I, I'm not a doctor.
I'm a sales guy. That's what I started doing. I did for seven years. But for a year, I've been tracking a company that I think has the potential to be that engine for integrated medicine. And it does all of the things that I spoke about. It's called Airbiotics. And in two weeks' time, two weeks tonight, we're going to have a webinar about it. Goevomed.com slash airbiotics dash webinar. I'm talking about the first in-house, in-practice, in-hospital cleaning system where the cleaning is done by beneficial microbes. We are going to rewild the internal environment where Americans spend 93% of their time and the, the science that has been done in Europe and all the studies they've done is incredibly exciting. Now, why would a cleaning company want to partner with the evolution of medicine? The evolution of medicine is about evolutionary concepts within medicine of which our interaction with microbes is the most important, but they want to partner with us because this is a proven, effective cleaning technology, but if it's going to be if it's going to really make a difference, it's going to be because it's not only the first cleaner, it's actually a health product. It's a way of delivering microbes. It's a way of delivering probiotics that's in the house all the time. And we will have on the webinar, we'll have a directory of all the science. It's very impressive. I've been sending to people all the time already. And this, you know, talk about, you know, Lysol is gone, but even the non-toxic cleaners, they're not bad for you, but they're not really healthy. Imagine if you had a way of cleaning the houses and all kind of uh, areas that was uh, that was actually healthy for you. So I think that it is going to re-educate the population on beneficial microbes. It's going to create urgency before we get to illness about understanding it. It's going to talk about root cause resolution. What is the solution if you have an environmental medicine patient? It's always like you've got to tear down the house and get rid of the mold. How many tear down the house people have we got? It doesn't scale. It's not going to work. This is amazing for mold and biofilms. You, when you see the science, I think you'll be um, taken out, engage everyone passionate about this movement to work with their passion. We're going to hire a massive army of people to go out and educate people about this. And guess what? When they look for a doctor, they're going to be looked, looking for one that is ecologically aligned. And that's all of you guys out there. So this year, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Liberty Direct. We're going to get you with a practitioner. We're going to get patients with practitioners that could deal with your internal microbiome. And we're also going to help to regulate the external microbiome in your house and the place where you're getting these environmental illnesses. That's where we're going to spend a lot of time this year. The next date, November 2nd, the Hormone Symphony, right back, same place, same time, November 2nd. We'll see you on October 19th. This is the Functional Forum. Good night.